The crossing of Aldo Ray, West Oaks, pronounced Oaks, holds a Master of Fine Arts from National University in San Diego. He lives in southern Arizona and is the author of the zombie novel Empire Salt from Abaddon Books. He was awarded the 2005 Bram Stoker Award for his first novel, Scarecrow Gods, and has also been nominated for Pushcart Prize for short fiction for his stories in Appalachian Galapagos. His other novels include Recall the Life, The Golden Thread, Blaze of Glory, and The Track of the Storm. The Crossing of Aldo Ray was inspired by late night television, he reveals, where the hero is always one, even in the most ridiculously dire straits. Oaks wishes life could be that easy, but he knows the vicissitudes of living along the Mexican American border don't always allow a hero to be a hero. So you will often find him walking quietly along the border fence, listening for the groans and telltale knocking that can only come from Los Muertos. In the meantime, to keep in shape, he races tarantula wasps, wrestles rattlesnakes, and bakes in the noonday sun so that when the time comes, he'll be ready to run. There's a quote from Cormac McCarthy, um, my favorite novel of his, The Crossing. It, here's a quote. Deep in each man is knowledge that something knows of his existence, something knows and cannot be fled nor hid from. All right, here we go. In the long, cold evening with the darkness dripping from the sky, I stood among them all. I, Aldo Ray, was ready to cross. I was ready to die. I was ready to do anything so long as I could get home. I had to get to my son. He had been taken, and here I was, caught on the wrong side of the border. A breeze smelling of sage and tumbleweed swept across us. I swayed with those around me, allowing the wind to push me as if I were a stalk of wheat or a wildflower along the side of the road. To do anything else would be human, and they were far removed from human, as was I. We moved forward toward, we moved forward into the fence. We pressed as one. I could feel it give. I could feel it groan. In answer, we all groaned, adding our miserable symphony to the wind that raced along the thin barrier of metal all the way to the Pacific Ocean on one side and the Gulf of Mexico on the other. We had been walking for two days, days dragging, tripping, stumbling through torpid heat and bone-chilling cold. And muertos did not feel anything anymore, but for us on the models, it was all too real. We wanted to wipe the sweat from our faces and clutch our arms to our bodies, but we could not. The muertos never would. The walking dead felt nothing, nothing except the need to feed, to find out, to find out which they had, to find that which they had lost, to move towards something they could no longer understand. And because they would not, neither could we, to survive that mimicking as best we could this dance of the dead across the rolling sands of the Sonoran Desert. Los Vaqueros began following us on the second day. They rode far out in the shadows of our crossing, careful not to let the muertos see their movement. Some said they were Mexican army, others said that they were enchantadores, and the reason for the muertos. Whatever they were, they could not really stop us. They just hovered on the edge of my vision, lean mirages twisting with an equine grace that left me longing to be alive once more. But that was not to be. I was dead, or at least the muertos thought so, and that was the secret. They could not smell, nor did they seem to have any supernatural ability to realize that I was alive. But they could tell by the movement the difference between Anamato and Muerto. They could hear us and know from our speech that we were alive. The trick, as I had discovered on my two previous crossings, was to move like them, regardless of what might happen. In front and behind me, I knew of four other Anamatos like myself. The two of us were trying to get back to our families. Another worked for the Zetas out of Nuevo Laredo. He was a sicario, a drug mule, and took drugs across the border. The last was an Americano who had gotten drunk, been robbed, and sought to return to his home. It was an irony that he had to pretend to be a dead one of us in order to get back to, to where he belonged so that he could live. He had approached me a week before, having sought me out at Puerto Penasco at the Sea of Cortez, where I was trying to earn enough money to pay the coyotes for safe passage back across the fence. A shrimp boat captain I knew pointed me out as one who knew how to cross, who had done it before. I need to get back, he said. No way. You're American. No way. But, but I can pretend to be dead, he argued. I, I can do this. I can do what it takes. All I want is to go home. I still turned him down. How can someone from a land that is so alive be any good at pretending to be dead? How can uh, someone from a land that is so alive be any good at pretending to be dead? And I would have never have shown him had I not gotten the call from me esposa, telling me that my son had disappeared from the playground. Some predator had stolen him, and I needed to return. So I taught the Americano, also knowing that I might need him to help me if it came to that. Are you sure they can't tell him alive? I remember how remarkable it was that he never once disbelieved the muertos, 
He took it for granted that they were real, so American to believe so easily. Then we had lain on the ground, pretending to be dead, our bodies covered in pig's blood and entrails until the herd had approached. They came from the black sand, heading inexorably towards a lonely spot in the desert where it looked like the dunes met sky. When they came grunting and groaning over the top of us, the hardest thing was to keep still. We let them stagger over us, taking us for fellow muertos. The herd was halfway over me when, in a state of electric terror, I slowly lurched to my feet and joined them in their northbound shuffle. That was two days ago. Two days of sweating and shitting and crying as I cramped and stumbled so many times, almost giving away my living condition. They never stopped, so I never stopped. That is, until we came to the fence the Americans had built. So many thought it was to keep people like me out. They had no idea about the black sand that was growing like a cancer to the old country, infecting all those who walked across it, turning them into mad, hungry creatures. We kept pushing against the fence. I felt the press of dead and rotting bodies against me. Teeth snapped near my ear. I watched beetles burrow into the skin of the woman directly in front of me, someone's mother who was forever changed. Here and there, pieces of them were missing as older bodies had risen up while the black sand crept across the land. Some were nothing but dry bones and guitar string tendons. Others had blown apart. The heat expanded their bodies until the stitches along the torsos had snapped, peeling back the skin like their flesh were a strange rare, rare fruit that blossomed only on the march. Suddenly a man screamed. It was the Sicario. He had lost it. He shouted for the Muertos to get away from him, for them to let him through. There was an uncomfortable rustling as everyone began to turn towards the flightly movements of one they had thought of as their own. He screamed again, this time using my name. If you want to see him again, he shouted. I turned with, with the Muertos, just in time to watch. One of them chew his ear off, as casually as a cow would munch a wildflower in the field. The Sicario pushed the thing aside that had once been a woman and drew a pistol from beneath his poncho. He fired several shots toward the knees of those nearest him, sending them tumbling to the sand. He turned towards the barrier and fired again until the pathway was cleared before him. He hollered for me once again, but I could no more help him than I could help myself. He leapt upon the dead, writhing bodies, using them as stepping stones for his last desperate jump. He dropped the gun and grasped the top of the fence, all in one gallant move. He began to heave himself up at the top, when one of the things grabbed his foot, and it held him there as a muerto child crawled up its back and sunk broken yellow teeth into the mule's leg. The Sicario screamed and kicked but could not break free. The muerto child wrenched back his head and came out with meat, leaving a red shiny bone free to be tickled none so gently by the hot desert air. The Sicario screeched incoherently. This time when he kicked out, he lost his grip and fell backwards. He hit the ground with the bone joint thud and was quickly lost from sight amongst the crush of the dead. His screams were abruptly silenced, only to be replaced by the hungry groans of the muertos, who were too far away to feed, but realized that a meal was being missed, just beyond their grasp. I groaned with them, at once horrified by the death and relieved that it was not me. Then I spied a camera atop the barrier. It sat several meters west of my herd and focused on the incident. The Americans, they saw everything. They did not do any, that they did not do anything was as much a part of who they were. I imagined them in some sort of immense building with a million monitors watching everyone doing everything but doing nothing about it themselves. What good, I wondered, was all that technological superiority if it was never used? As the weight of the dead man pressed against me, I became aware of the packets taped to my ribs and chest. They contained I knew not what, but getting them to the other side was what the Sicario told me would keep my son alive. They had found me soon after the Americano and co-opted both of us into their crime, for it was their car that my son had entered. The barrier began to creak and bend. It was not designed for the weight of the herd. The excitement of the feast had brought more muertos forward until the press drove all the air from my lungs. I was desperate to breathe, inhaling shallowly as I pushed with the rest. My head swam. For a moment, I was no longer there, but transported to a time before. Aldo, Aldo, came a plaintive cry from the telephone. Jose, he's taken. What do you mean, taken? He was at the playground, Aldo, with the other boys. Then on the way home, he got into a car. What kind of car? Whose car? A big one. A town car, I think, Aldo. The unspoken question was, did I know to whom it belonged? Did you call the police? Of course not. She cursed to herself. Aldo! You know we can't do that. Why such a question? Have there been any calls? Aldo, why would there be calls? Tell me, who would call? I don't know. I don't know. My lie lay there, expanding in...